From KPBS and PRX, this is Port of Entry. Where we tell cross-border stories that connect us. I'm Natalie Gonzalez. And I'm Alan Liliental. So a lot of us struggle with mental health issues because life can feel heavy sometimes, and that is totally normal. But when you're a little kid and it's one of your parents struggling with a really intense mental illness, the experience can really change the way you relate to everything. The first time I realized that my dad was sick was when he, uh, he would wrap himself in foil. This is Michelle Guerrero. And at first, when her father would suffer a break from reality and do strange things like cover himself in foil, she wasn't really concerned. I think the first time he did it, I, I, I didn't really know that, it, that there was something wrong because I just kind of thought, okay, like, my dad's doing this, like, it's normal. Michelle eventually realized that her dad was convinced the government was spying on him, hence the foil. You see, life at this place where the U.S. and Mexico meet means dealing with a heavily surveilled, demilitarized border all the time. And that's what Michelle's family did. They lived just a few miles from the border and crossed to see family a lot. So her dad's claims with that backdrop seemed kind of plausible. But then one day he went so deep into the conspiracy that Michelle just couldn't believe him anymore. He tore his apartment up just looking for, like, cameras and because he thought there was somebody watching him. And I think that was, like, the moment that I kind of, like, really understood what was going on. So by the time she was in elementary school, Michelle's world just totally got turned upside down. Her dad started spiraling out of control. And he was using drugs to cope, which, of course, only made things worse. He was constantly bouncing back and forth between sanity and insanity. Eventually, he left his family and went to Asia, Europe, and then ended up in Mexico, where he lives today. After years of watching her dad struggle, Michelle started to experience mental health issues of her own. And she started thinking she was destined to follow her father's path. I thought it was crazy a lot of the times, and I think that mostly when I, like, I just accepted my depression and my anxiety is just, like, part of who I was because I thought it was just in my genes because my dad, and I, I didn't think that there was any way to, like, overcome that or fight that. I just thought that that was just the way it was going to be forever. Michelle did eventually end up following her dad's path. She actually went pretty far down it and started to sink deeper into addiction. I wanted to feel numb, and so, like, I was open to anything that was just going to make me, make me feel good. I was really, really depressed at the time, and I was suicidal as well, and so I I think that it just helped me, or I thought that it was helping me, like, cope, um, but really it was just drowning me. But eventually, Michelle surfaced, and she found a new way to cope. Through painting murals. What, that's what I love about art, is that I just, I feel like I disappear into the wall and I don't really exist. Like, I'm in my own world. Problems just kind of go away, and that's why I like, I like to paint so much, because it's therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful, me too. That's why I do music. So yeah, Michelle ended up carving out her own path. She did, but it wasn't easy. No fue nada fácil para ella. But it was honestly to the day, to this day, like the most insanely hard thing I've ever done and the loneliest thing I've ever done. Today in Port of Entry. We continue our season on artists and musicians who have turned pain into superpowers. We've got more on Michelle's cross-border story right after a quick break. Regresamos pronto. No, no se, se muevan. muevan.
Donations come in many forms. A sustaining membership, a one-time gift, even that extra vehicle you no longer need. Learn more about the advantages of donating a vehicle. Here's how. Go to kpbs.careasy.org or call 877-KPBS-CAR. Estamos de regreso en Port of Entry. The U.S. Mexico border crossing has really made its mark on San Isidro. That's the city that butts up against the border fence. And the impact is not good. The closer you get to the border crossing in San Isidro, honestly, let's just say it's not a pretty place to be. There are about a million really bright money exchange places crammed next to each other. Overpriced parking lots are everywhere, taking up a lot of space. There's also clothing shops and hundreds of kind of not-so-nice signs advertising all kinds of things. Just consumerism everywhere. Just long story short, it's chaotic and crazy. But right in the middle of all that crazy chaos are a few glimpses of real artistic beauty. So right now, we're standing in front of my mural at El Rincón in San Isidro. Again, Michelle Guerrero. These days, though, Michelle is actually better known as the street artist and muralist, Mr. B. Baby. I like to use a lot of bright, vibrant colors, so it's just like this colorful piece. The piece is a feathered serpent, and he's basically offering a flower to the moon. And I have my character Chucho and Maria riding on his back. It's kind of hard to describe, but that's, that's the best I could do. So a few months ago, Michelle actually took our producer, Kinsey Moreland, and me on a tour of some of her murals in San Diego. Okay, so it's down that way and hard to find, ah. which, I, which I hate because I like this mural and I wish it was more visible. Yeah. We are walking along some train tracks in Chula Vista. I've never been here. There's, it doesn't seem like they're... In use, there's plants growing on the train tracks. Uh, we're walking towards what looks like a giant mural made up of what I now know as seven different artists' panels. Oh wow, some really, really gorgeous, huge murals. Different styles, there's different artists, but they're all very, very Latino-inspired. A lot of co Mexican colors and kind of iconography, but done in a very modern way. So yeah, that was me trying to describe Michelle's murals while standing right in front of one of them in Chula Vista mm. a little while back. But it's always kind of hard to describe art through audio. Yeah. yeah. I'll do my best. Basically, we were on this bike path and eventually we got to this huge concrete wall covered by eight different murals. Nice, 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 nice. What kind of murals? Uh, they were murals in all different kinds of art genres. Nice, nice. Like some abstract, impressionistic, some super realistic ones. But my favorite mural, at least for me, was by far Michelle's. Avi. It was honestly my favorite one walking in here. I'm, I'm really not just saying that because you're here. Like, wow, it's, it's, for me, it's really special because my dad collects masks. So the wall of our, my, of my parents' house living room, right where we watch TV, there's like probably like 60, 70 of these kinds of masks that are so eclectic and colorful and look like they could be from so many different places, but they're, they're, they're also like weirdly of the same culture that all look inspired by some, by like Latino culture colors. Okay, so you were kind of right. Uh, and it's, you know, what's funny is like my living room looks exactly like that too. Okay, I have a bunch cool. of masks. And so, and I've always had my, my house or apartments like decorated like that. So they're actually, all kinds of different cultures and so that's kind of why I wanted to uh, put that here because it kind of is inclusive of as many cultures as I could get down. Um, a lot of them are Mexican, I have Filipino, I have Africa, I have um, India, I have there's there's others um, but they're all different cultures and what I liked about it is that even though they're all cultures that are very different that they all have like a mask and that they all look so cohesive and like beautiful like together and it just goes to show like we all are kind of connected by art and drawn to like these beautiful things like just as people and so that's kind of why I chose to do to do this 
The last of Michelle's murals we visited that day was a huge piece in Barrio Logan. That's San Diego's mostly Mexican neighborhood that's about 15 miles north of the border. Michelle's family actually has a deep connection to Barrio Logan. Her dad worked a decade at the shipyard here, and her grandma still runs a carnicera in the neighborhood. So she's stoked to be painting murals here. Oh, wow. Wow, this is beautiful. Thank you. I mean, they're all beautiful. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This one looks like it could be like an incredible blanket. You know That's I mean? kind of like what it, it's inspired by all the, all the, the Tommy patterns. Do you find that you like work through your own shit emotionally when you're doing these pieces? Yeah, 100%. I feel like art is the only thing that just kind of takes me away. Like when I'm doing it, I don't really, like my thoughts are gone. Everything's gone. I'm just kind of like zoned in into like this world that I'm creating. And so for me, it's really soothing and peaceful. And I think that's why I'm just so fortunate to be able to do it as, as a job and not just a hobby and um, to have that escape. So in almost all of Michelle's murals I saw on the tour that day, and actually in a lot of her work, there are these two very recognizable recurring characters. One is this wolf-like, very colorful monster guy named Chucho. <laughs> Chuchito, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's super cute, but also looks a little mischievous. And the other is a traditional muñeca named Maria. I know these muñecas. I've seen those dolls my entire life when I used to travel around Mexico. So they have these black braids and are usually dressed in these traditional Mexican dresses, right? Yeah, those. Yeah. So I asked Michelle about what Chucho and Maria mean to her and why she always paints them. Maria is just like the doll that you find in Mexico and she just kind of represents my inner child and also a representation of my daughter. And then Chucho is my guy that, he's a piñata and basically... That's Chucho right in yeah. So piñatas originated in China and they were like held over the garden and they were broken and so the seeds would grow. So like I like the idea that like through brokenness comes growth because that's kind of like my story. Like I, I went through a lot of like things in order to get to where I'm at right now. And so that's kind of why I kept painting him and I paint him in a lot of like metaphors where he's like cracked and broken and plants are growing, just kind of like my story. I feel like through all the hits that I got in my life, like it really made me like the person that I am today. So Michelle grew up not too far from the port of entry in San Isidro, where one of her murals you visited is located. Yep, she grew up just a few freeway exits north in Chula Vista. And as a daughter of a Puerto Rican mom and a Mexican dad, she obviously spoke Spanish at home. But in school, she actually wasn't allowed to speak Spanish at all. That's not cool, man. Not cool at all. Since there was a few, only a few people that didn't speak Spanish, they didn't allow us to speak Spanish. And if we did get caught speaking Spanish, we would actually end up in detention. And because of that, I feel a little bit um, sad because I, I think in because of that, I, I lost a lot of my uh, my Spanish speaking skills. I, I do speak it now, but just not as um, not as clearly as I would like to. For as long as Michelle can remember, maybe in part because that school repressed her from being who she was, she started suffering from this really bad anxiety. She was so shy that as a kid, she would completely freeze up. So when I was young, my anxiety was, um, it, like, it was really intense. And so when I uh, would go to school and the teachers would call on me, um, I would just break down and cry. Like, even just, like, them calling me to answer a question, like, that's how bad my anxiety was. I didn't really have any friends. I didn't talk to anyone. And because of that, I was actually held back a grade because they thought that I couldn't speak. Even though I could speak, I just was so shy that I, that I didn't want to. I feel this. I was exactly the same, but I went to music. As a way to escape her anxiety and avoid socializing with other kids, Michelle started drawing and making art. 
Yeah, and she was super good at it early on. I was pretty young, probably like six or seven, and uh, my school had a competition to make like these little bookmarks and whoever's bookmark was the best, they were gonna hang it up in the hallway. And I remember at the time, I just had a vision of a pink bunny like sitting on a hill. And it was the first time I remember thinking to put the image that was like, or the scene that was like in my head onto a piece of paper. And uh, that bookmark actually won the award and that was like my first moment of like, hey, like, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> my anxiety was probably my reason for really just jumping into my art. Um, it, I feel like art has always been very therapeutic for me. And so when I was feeling down or depressed, I would really just express myself through painting and art. And it really helped me cope. Part of what Michelle was escaping through her art was the chaos at home. Her father was slipping further and further into his mental illness. But you know what? She has happy memories from that time, too. For example, her dad's mom, Michelle's grandma, would take her and her sister across the border to Mexico a lot. And it was during the trips to Tijuana that Michelle fell in love with Mexican art and crafts she loved seeing all the street vendors out selling their wood carvings and other colorful handmade things. But by high school, Michelle's anxiety was still a big barrier in her life. And it was at this point that she started using drugs and alcohol to calm her nerves and make her feel more at ease in those awkward high school situations. I feel like because I was drinking so much, I had like some some like incidents happen to me, which kind of had me spiraling more into a depression. And as I got older, I just kept drinking alcohol to try to cope with it. And um, it just ended up causing even more problems and more issues and more situations that I ended up in that um, that made it worse. And it was just like this downward spiral. But she didn't spiral too far down. Despite her struggles, Michelle did graduate high school. And that's when she moved to San Francisco to go to art school. Right out of the gate, though, Michelle says she felt like she was way behind the other students. My mom had always put into my head that education was like the most important thing that I, that I needed to pursue. I just didn't have very many interests except for art. Art was, my, was really like the only thing I, I really loved to do. And... For the most part, I don't feel like I was very talented at all. I, I feel like I was probably, I, I, I feel like my peers were a lot better than I was. And I think that also made me kind of depressed and make, made me feel like, okay, like this is definitely never ever going to happen because these people are so much um, better than me. Um, I even had a teacher tell me that I just like wasn't cut out for it. We had figure drawing classes and I didn't really know what that meant. It was my first day in college and uh, I showed up to my figure drawing class and then I just remember there was like a, a stand or like a stage and this guy just came up and stood there and then he just took off his towel and was just butt naked and I remember how shocked I was because I didn't know that that's what figure drawing was. Um, you know, eventually I got used to it. I saw naked people my entire college uh, education, but I, I remember that I was so nervous trying to draw him. I don't know why, I just did not expect that. <laughs> Awkward! <laughs> you know, Michelle felt like a fish out of water, and there just weren't a lot of students or teachers of color she could relate to. There was not very many Latinos, and uh, I did have a, an experience with a teacher who was extremely like sexist and... I feel like racist towards me and a friend of mine. And I actually tried to report it and I wrote about it and uh, nothing was ever done about it. I just, I felt insanely uncomfortable. That feeling of otherness, of always being an outsider, only made her anxiety and depression worse. She was still using alcohol to deal with some of those feelings. But by the time she graduated art school, she managed to build up enough confidence in herself and her skills that she made solid plans to launch her art career. 
The plan was to leave to LA and to try to pursue my career in LA, but then I met my ex-husband and I stayed. And then that's when things got really bad. We'll get into the story after a short break. No se vayan a ningún lado. KPBS On Demand is supported by Illumina, a global leader in DNA sequencing, helping clinicians and researchers all over the world understand the genetics of disease to make personalized medicine a reality. From genetic testing to developing new vaccines to help protect people around the globe, Illumina DNA sequencing is impacting the future of healthcare. Discover more about the power of the genome by visiting illumina.com kpbs. Y estamos de vuelta con nuestra historia transfronteriza. Okay, so Michelle had noticed this cute guy around her neighborhood. And one night at a bar, the two started talking, and it was a super quick romance from there. We actually rushed into things really fast. And he asked me to marry him, I think, like a year after we'd been dating. The guy was a recovering heroin addict. Yeah, but that was in his past, and Michelle had a rough past, too, so they actually bonded over their struggles. I was just always drawn to, like, broken people and, like, people who had, like, a past, and it was just, like, it was something that intrigued me. And he had a really hard childhood, and so he he was open about it all. Like, he would go to the methadone clinic, to, which is what people who are recovering from heroin take. And so I knew, because he would, he would always have to go to the clinic. Um, but... From talking to him, I assumed that it was like something in the past, or I, my, na I, my naive self thought so at the time, you know? At first, things were all good. But before too long, Michelle's new husband had an accident at work, and things took a turn. One week after we got married, he was actually a sound engineer. And it was a random night where they asked him to do something like out of his element that he normally didn't do, which was to change the sign outside, um, like the marquee where it says like the different bands that are playing. And he had climbed up on a ladder to change it. And the ladder was really unsturdy and he ended up falling and completely crushing his elbow. It's a story we have all heard too many times. First came the pain. Then came the pills. Then came the crippling addiction. Michelle's husband got hooked on opiates, again. And this time, he took Michelle down with him. Misery loves company. I think he didn't, he wanted me to, to really like be in it with him. All of it, including his addiction. He definitely pressured me into taking them because he would tell me that um, he'd be like, "No, try, try him again, try him again. Like, trust me. Like, I, like every time's better. Every time's better." And so I trusted him, and so I did. I, I would, I took them with him, and then next thing you know, I looked up and I, I was having withdrawals, and I was like, "Oh, okay, I'm addicted to these," um, and that was. That was a very, very scary moment in my life. So addiction can be a really sneaky thing, right? For sure. And here's the thing. Sometimes people don't even realize they are addicted until they stop doing the thing that they're addicted to. And that was the case for Michelle. But then we couldn't get the pills and... Um, We were actually in L.A. We went to L.A. And on Venice Boardwalk and we started walking around the, the boardwalk and that's when I got like the insane chills and the sweats and I started vomiting and all the symptoms of withdrawals. That's when I knew that I had a very big problem. In the back of Michelle's mind, There was always this worry 
She thought she was destined to become her dad. Yeah, I absolutely did. I, I thought it was crazy a lot of the time. I definitely had moments where I would do drugs and I would just think like, like during my high that like I was never going to come back to reality and I would I would just lose my mind and um, and it was scary. Yeah. So those prescription pain pills eventually turned into heroin. Michelle says once they made that jump, she tried hard to quit a few different times. But she said the withdrawals made her feel like she was dying. Things just got darker and darker. My artwork took like a, a big shift because back then it used to be really dark. Like it would be muted colors. Until one day, an unexpected moment of light. I found out I was pregnant and then that was when reality set in that I needed to get my life together. And so I made the choice to get clean. I wasn't going to do that to her, so I, I had to quit. And that was my only option. At first, Michelle didn't go to rehab or take methadone or even see a therapist. She didn't reach out for any help at all. Instead, she just quit cold turkey and spent a lot of time alone. Because in my head, I was like, if I, if I seek the help, then they're going to take away my baby. So I, I did it. I recovered and did all of that by myself. I slept through it, like, as much as I could. Like, you, when you're going through withdrawals, like, you can only sleep so much. And you have, like, restless, like, leg syndrome. Like, you have a lot of restless nights. But I just kind of, I slept through it. And then I, sub, there's a thing called, like, Suboxone, like, tabs. And so I started to take um, a tab, but, like, I knew I was pregnant and I hadn't really like, I didn't really know the effects. So I was so paranoid about that. So I would, every single day I would take less and less and less to the point that I was taking like a microscopic amount, <laughs> but I was terrified to stop because I did not want to feel the withdrawals. And I actually had to go to a therapist who I spoke to because I needed to talk to somebody because I was going crazy in my head about the Suboxone and the baby and, um, and I told him and I showed him because he asked me, he's like, well, how much are you taking? And I showed him and he just laughed and was like, you know, it's all in your head, right? He's like, go home tomorrow. Don't take it. And you're going to be 100 percent fine. And um, I don't know why I needed to hear that. And once I I took his advice and I, I didn't take it. And that was when I was like, wow, like I'm finally like free. So, yeah, after her daughter was born, Michelle just totally flipped her script and got her life in order. As soon as I held her, I knew that I was never going to I was never going to touch that again, that she, I wasn't going to put her through that. So I um, she was my strength through it all. I loved her and I was I was so happy to be a mom and to to have her in my life. So it was in a way, like my daughter was like my little angel that saved me. And so that kind of was like what ignited like my flame to being where I'm at today. How was school today? Good. Yeah. You're what, seven? No, six. Six? Whoa, you're a tall six year old. <laughs> so Kinsey and I recently caught up with Michelle and her daughter. We played a game of truth or dare, which is not really a thing in Mexico. Or at least it wasn't for me and my friends. Truth or dare? This light, go. No, you have to, you accept. Do you accept truth, truth or dare? Or do you oh, accept a dare? sorry, I'm too Mexican for this game. <laughs> uh, tr truth. No, dare, dare. I dare you to go down again, that's a lie. <laughs> Man, no biggie. Kinsey and I also really, really tried to give her daughter the courage to go down this tunnel slide that she was afraid of. Uh, why can I not go behind you? Okay, you can go behind me. We both went down the slide to show her how easy and fun it was. And I even went down the fire pole. And I always hated that thing when I was a kid. But she stood her ground and just didn't want to do it. Five, four, three, two, one. Go! It's too small. Got you. 
I have no doubt that Michelle's daughter will get over her fear and do things way scarier than going down a slide someday. Because she's got a powerful role model, her mom, Michelle, who pulled herself out of addiction and has now become one of the best-known muralists in San Diego. Yeah, I saw an article about her and her art on the front page of the art section of the San Diego Union Tribune recently. She's getting gigs in Oaxaca, New Mexico, L.A. Yeah, and she's becoming really well-known for her bright murals celebrating Latin culture. Her art has definitely evolved from the darker themes of her past to much happier stuff. Yeah, her murals make me joyous every time I see them. Her only struggle now is figuring out how to balance her success with being a single mom. I mean, it's really, really hard um, to be gone and to do this. And I mean, a lot of times I beat myself up and feel like I'm being selfish. But at the end of the day, like I just kind of remind myself of my end goal. And I try to involve my daughter and like, like if I'm working in town, I always try to bring her so she could see like that what I'm creating and what I'm doing and that I'm out here working and hustling and chasing my dream, like for not just for me, but for, for the both of us. And um, it's definitely a challenge, but I, I try my best. I still haven't figured out the best balance, but, um, but I'm definitely, I'm working on it. <laughs> Michelle is a really great mom, and her daughter is totally awesome. She's an artist and a dancer, and she told us she's one of the fastest kids in her class. My hope is that, you know, through my art, just kind of shows her that she can, like that anything is possible, like whatever it is she wants to do, hip-hop dancing, whatever she, she's into, you know, that she can make it happen for herself, you know? Well, thanks She's for meeting up with us again. Truth or dare? Okay, final one. Um, truth. Pick dare, please. No, I have we a good day. Go You're gonna make me go. Up no again. more slides. No, I'm not. Okay, dare. Um, I dare you to go on the dolphin. That's easy. You can see some of Michelle's work on her Instagram page. She's at Mr. B Baby. That's the letter B as in boy, baby. While you're on Instagram, make sure to follow us too. We are at Port of Entry Pod. And by the way, Michelle's sister, Jean Guerrero, used to report on the border here at KPBS. She actually wrote a book that digs much deeper into their family's story. It's called Crux, a cross-border memoir. Port of Entry is written and produced by Kinsey Moreland. Emily Jankowski is the co-producer and director of sound design. Alisa Barba is our editor. Lisa Morissette is operations manager. And John Decker is the interim associate general manager of content. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. I'm Alan Liliental. And I'm Natalie Gonzalez. Bye, adios. Nos vemos. Thank you.